The Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee will come to order. And I want to begin by thanking Mr. Lars Jorgensen, uh, the CEO of Inova Nordis, uh, for being with us today for this important hearing. The issue that we are discussing this morning is not complicated. It has everything to do with the chart behind me, which shows that Novo Nordisk's diabetes drug, Ozempic, is sold in Canada for $155, in Denmark for $122, in France for $71, and in Germany for $59. In the United States, Novo Nordisk charges us $969, over 15 times more than they sell that product in Germany. Wagovi, Novo Nordisk weight loss drug, is even more expensive. As the chart behind me also shows, Wagovi is sold for $265 in Canada. $186 in Denmark, $137 in Germany, and $92 in the United Kingdom. In the U.S., the list price for Wagovi is $1,349 a month, nearly 15 times as much as it costs in the United Kingdom. What we are dealing with today is not just an issue of economics, it is not just an issue of corporate greed. It is a profound moral issue. Novo Nordisk has developed game-changing drugs which, if made affordable, can save the lives of tens of thousands of Americans every year and significantly improve the quality of life of millions more, if made affordable. If not made affordable, Americans throughout this country will needlessly die and suffer. As representatives of the American people, we cannot allow that to happen. And let's be clear, the outrageously high cost of Ozempic, Wagovi, and other prescription drugs is directly related to the broken, dysfunctional, and cruel healthcare system in our country. While the current system makes huge profits for large drug companies like Novo Nordisk, huge profits for insurance companies, and huge profits for PBMs, it is failing the needs of ordinary Americans. In the United States today, we spend almost twice as much per capita on healthcare as the people of any other country. Nearly $13,500 for every man, woman, and child, over 17% of our GDP. Yet, despite this huge and unsustainable expenditure, we are the only major country on Earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a human right. Further, despite all of that spending, our health care outcomes are not particularly good. Today, over 85 million Americans are uninsured or underinsured. Over 60,000 die each year because they don't get to a doctor when they should, and our life expectancy, which is actually declining in many parts of the country, is far below most of the wealthy countries. So what does all of this have to do with Mr. Jorgensen, Novo Nordisk, and our hearing today? A lot. The simple truth is that we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs and that is a major factor in the health care crisis we experience. How does that happen? What's the connection? First, one out of four Americans are unable to afford the prescription drugs that their doctors prescribe. Insanely, that means that millions of Americans go without the treatment that their doctors recommend. The result, some will actually die and others will become much sicker than they should, and millions will unnecessarily end up in emergency rooms or hospitals at great expense to our health care system. How crazy is that? Second, one of the reasons that hospital costs, it's not just prescription drugs, hospital costs 
in this country are rapidly rising has to do with the very high cost of prescription drugs. In my hospital in Burlington, Vermont, CEO there tells me that 20% of his budget goes to the high cost of prescription drugs. And there are treatments now that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Third, a significant reason for the high cost of insurance policies. If you're upset out there that you're paying very high amounts of money for your insurance, has to do to a significant degree with the high cost of prescription drugs. Yes, millions of Americans with decent health insurance pay minimal amounts for their prescription drugs. That's the good news. The bad news is that they are paying a fortune in premiums, deductibles, and copayments for the insurance that covers those drugs. I should also add that if you're a taxpayer in this country, you're paying higher taxes than you should because of the inflated costs that Medicare, Medi Medicaid, and other public health programs pay for prescription drugs. Now, that is the overview and why the issue that we're discussing today is so important. It impacts every aspect of our health care system, the federal budget, private insurance. Now, let's get to the particulars with regard to Novo Nordisk, Ozempic, and Wagovi. Ozempic and Wagovi are different brand names for the same drug, semaglutide. These drugs are transformative new treatments for diabetes and obesity that help people control their blood sugar and lose weight. Both are manufactured by Novo Nordisk, and both are on track to be some of the best-selling and most profitable drugs in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, since 2018, Novo Nordisk has made nearly $50 billion in sales off of these two drugs. Importantly, for members of this committee, 72% of that revenue comes from sales in the United States of America. In other words, the United States is Novo Nordisk cash cow for Ozempic and Wagovi. And given that these drugs will need to be taken over the course of a lifetime, it's not a one-time drug, you take it for your whole life, Novo Nordisk can expect to receive tens of billions in sales and huge profits from these drugs year after year after year. Now, why does Novo Nordisk charge the American people such outrageously high prices for Ozempic and Wagovi? Are they acting illegally by charging us some, such high prices? Are they violating the law? No, they're not. What they're doing is perfectly lawful. They are simply taking advantage of the fact that, until very recently, the United States has been the only major country on Earth not to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs. In other words, Novo Nordisk and other drug companies, not just Novo Nordisk, can charge us as much as the market can bear. And that is precisely what they are doing. Now, in a few minutes, Mr. Yor when Mr. Jorgensen makes his presentation, and we look forward to hearing from him, I suspect that he will tell us that the health care system here in the United States is complex, and that there is a difference between the list price and the net price as a result of the rebates that PBMs receive. And this committee has begun to do some serious work with regard to PBMs. And if he says that, he is correct. But even factoring in all of the rebates that PBMs receive, the net price for Ozempic is still nearly $600 over nine times as much as it costs in Germany. And the estimated net price of Ogovi is over $800, nearly four and a half times as much as it costs in Denmark. What must also be understood is that not everybody can take advantage of the net price of these drugs. If you are uninsured, you pay the full list price. If you have a large deductible, you pay the full list price. If you have coinsurance, the percentage of the price you pay at the pharmacy counter is based on the list price. And let's be clear, 
75% of Americans, over 190 million people with insurance, are unable to access Wagovi through their insurance policies. Mr. Jorgensen may also tell us that Novo Nordis is afraid that if it substantially reduced the list price for Zempic and Wagovi, PBMs may limit coverage for these drugs. Well, Mr. Jorgensen, let me ease your concerns. I am delighted to announce today that I have received commitments in writing from all of the major PBMs that if Novo Nordis substantially reduced the list price for Ozempic and Wagovi, they would not, not limit coverage. In fact, all of them told me they would be able to expand coverage, expand coverage for these drugs if the list price was reduced. I ask unanimous consent to insert the letters I received from the PBMs making this commitment into the record. Now, let me share with the committee some other important information that we have uncovered as part of our investigation. Last week, I received a letter from over 250 doctors urging us to do everything that we can to substantially lower the price of these drugs. This should come as no surprise. What these doctors are telling us is that if the price of Ozempic and Wagovi is not substantially reduced, many of their patients who have diabetes and obesity, especially lower income Americans, often minority Americans, will be unable to afford these drugs. Some of these people, some of these patients will unnecessarily die and others will suffer a significant decline in their quality of life. I ask unanimous consent to enter that letter into the record. Earlier this year, Dr. Allison Galvani, an epidemiologist at Yale University, conducted a study on Wagovi. And what she found, and I hope Mr. Jorgensen pays attention to this, is that over 40,000 lives a year could be saved if Wagovi were made widely available and an affordable price to Americans who need the drug. 40,000 lives. I ask unanimous consent to insert that study into the record. A few months ago, Dr. Melissa Barber, a healthcare economist at Yale University, conducted a study on the cost, the cost of manufacturing Ozempic. And what she found is that Ozempic can be profitably manufactured for less than $5 a month. We all know the cost of production is not the only expense by far for a drug company. Pharmaceutical companies spend great sums of money on research and development to find new treatments with many of these products not coming to market. We all understand that. But it is important to know that this drug can be manufactured profitably for a few dollars a month. We may hear from Mr. Jorgensen that, notice that Novo Nordisk spent $21 billion on research and development since 2018, and I take his word on that. What he may not tell you is that Novo Nordisk spent $44 billion on stock buybacks and dividends over that same time period. In other words, since Ozempa came onto the market in 2018, Novo Nordisk spent over twice as much on stock buybacks and dividends that it spent on research and development. And let's be clear. Outrage over the high cost of Ozempic and other prescription drugs is not a partisan political issue, as I expect every person on this committee understands. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. I'm an independent, not an independent issue. The vast majority of the American people are sick and tired of paying outrageously high prices for prescription drugs. For example, Dale Folwell, the Republican treasurer of the state of North Carolina has told us that if he did not discontinue covering Wagovi for some 20,000 state workers in North Carolina, he would have been forced to double, double health insurance premiums for teachers, firefighters, and police officers in his state, regardless if they needed this drug or not. He would have had to double health insurance premiums in North Carolina. Of course, the shield of Michigan also announced that it would have to discontinue covering Wagovi because it was too expensive. And when we talk about differing political views, I will tell you that Elon Musk, not one of my great political allies, recently posted on Twitter, and I quote, 
Solving obesity greatly reduces risk of other diseases, especially diabetes, and improves quality of life. We do need to find a way to make appetite inhibitors available to anyone who wants them, end of quote. And Mr. Musk is right. Further, not only must we be concerned about lack of access to these drugs, we have also got to take a serious look at the financial implications of what happens if the prices of these drugs are not substantially reduced. <coughs> Bottom line, if just half of the adults in our country with obesity took weight loss drugs like Wagovi at current prices, the cost would be astronomical and would have a devastating financial impact on our country and on federal and state budgets. Best estimate that I have seen suggests that if half the adults in our country took these weight loss drugs, it would cost $411 billion a year, $411 billion, and that is more than what Americans spent on all prescription drugs at the pharmacy counter in 2020 or 2022. In other words, the outrageously high prices of these drugs could bankrupt Medicare and radically increase premiums to absolutely unaffordable rates. This does not have to happen. It does not have to happen. Over the last several months, I and my staff have been talking to a number of major generic pharmaceutical companies. These are large companies that supply hundreds of millions of prescriptions to many millions of Americans. And what these CEOs have told me is, another, is of enormous consequence. They have studied the matter, and they have told me that they can sell a generic version of Ozempic, the exact same drug that Novo Nordisk is manufacturing, to Americans for less than $100 a month, $100 a month. Novo Nordisk charges us $969 a month for Ozempic. These generics can sell it to us for less than $100. Let's be clear. Nobody here is asking Novo Nordisk to provide charity to the American people. Novo Nordisk has already made billions of dollars in profit off of these products, and in the coming years will make billions more. All we are saying, Mr. Jorgensen, is treat the American people the same way that you treat people all over the world. Stop ripping us off. A few months ago, President Biden and I wrote an op-ed which appeared in USA Today. And here's what the president and I said, quote, if Novo Nordisk and other pharmaceutical companies refuse the substantially lower prescription drug prices in our country and end their greed, we will do everything within our power to end it for them. Novo Nordisk must substantially reduce the price of Ozempic and Wagovi. As Americans, we must not rest until every person in our country can afford the prescription drugs they need to lead healthy, happy, and productive lives." End quote from the op-ed from the President and myself. That's what President Biden and I wrote a few months ago, and that's what I believe. Prescription drugs in this country must be affordable, and we must not be forced to pay far higher prices than people in other countries for the same exact product. This is especially true when we face a national emergency in terms of the twin epidemics of diabetes and obesity, which, if not addressed with lower-cost drugs, could cost us tens of thousands of lives and an unimaginable amount of money. Congress and the administration have a moral responsibility to act now, act boldly, and to protect the American people. Senator Cassidy, you are now recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Chair Sanders. Nearly one in three Americans live with obesity. Nearly one in 10 have type, di type 2 diabetes. And I'm a physician. I'm very aware of the implications of that. There are so many complications. Obesity leads to more chronic disease than any other condition, taking lives and costing, causing almost $173 billion in health care spending a year. It's almost impossible to bring down health care costs unless we effectively address obesity. Now we have GOP-1s. They have the promise to address both obesity and the complications that result. They're expensive. Now, we can argue about the net versus the list, but they're expensive. But let me say, without a profit motive, without something in return, it's unclear that these drugs or any drug is going to be developed. There is a tension 
a tension between the need to incentivize innovation and the ability to afford that innovation. And we are here struggling with that balance. Now, if anyone thinks going after big pharma is the silver bullet that if you do that, boom, healthcare costs or drug costs go down, they don't understand what happens with pricing a drug. There is no silver bullet. But as my friend Angus King says, there is silver buckshot. You do a little bit here and a little bit there and it adds up so the drugs become more affordable. Given that, we still have to preserve the profit incentive for the creativity for drug companies to invest in order to develop the drugs that are going to affect, that are going to positively affect the, the, the burden of disease in our society. Uh, this is a simple example I've used before. When I was in medical school, one of the most common surgeries was removing a portion of someone's stomach because of peptic ulcer disease. And then a drug called cimetidine came out, Tagamet, and within six months that surgery was rarely performed. Tagamet is so simple, it's now sold over the counter, but it has saved so many people having disabling surgery. Now, that is an example, but now we're speaking about Alzheimer's and cancer and obesity and the complications from obesity. And I think we have to be realistic. It is a profit motive that incentivizes creative people with capital to go in and find that cure. So, as this committee examines the affordability of GLPs, we have to also examine how do we preserve that incentive for the innovation. That is the tension. How do we preserve? Because, by the way, if we stop developing new drugs, Alzheimer's won't be cured, cancer won't be cured, and better drugs to address obesity and the complications of the medical, medical uh, of the metabolic syndrome will not either. So back to this hearing. There are serious questions that need to be asked. What has contributed to the high price of Ozempic and Wagovi? What are American patients actually paying for these drugs at the pharmacy counter? Frankly, what are Germans actually paying? They may pay some money at the counter, but I suspect that the health plan is also playing something. So, so what is the true cost relative to the true cost to us? By the way, I'm particularly concerned with folks with health savings accounts because the chair is right. If there is a list price which is really high and they have a drug benefit tied to their HSA, then that begins to drain their HSA. And I've always been an advocate of how do we make that health savings account more useful, but if it's being drained for a high list price, it is less useful. I'm about that. So, so what can we do to make sure that Americans have access to an affordable cost and at the same time we have adequate incentive so that someone out there with an incurable disease knows that there might be hope along the way? I appreciate Mr. Jorgensen for attending the hearing. I look forward to your answers. Now it's important to note that while drug manufacturers play a significant role in determining the cost of a drug, the problem is greater, it's more complex than the actions of any one industry. So we need to make a serious effort to navigate the network of perverse incentives throughout our health care system, including taking a substantive look at health insurance benefit designs, price transparency, regulatory barriers, and the perverse effects of government discount programs have on prices that Americans pay at the commercial market. This committee has a long history of engaging in real bipartisan efforts to lower the cost of health care. Last year, Chair Sanders and I worked on the PBM Reform Act to address misaligned incentives affecting PBMs to lower the price patients pay for their prescriptions. The committee passed this legislation with overwhelming bipartisan support. By the way, we need to get this across the finish line and signed into law. And this is the kind of bipartisan work needed to tackle the high cost patients face for GLPs and for all drugs. So thanks again for our coming today, Mr. Jorgensen. I look forward to you explaining how to balance this tension between innovation and affordability. And with that, I yield. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, we will now turn to our witness panel. Uh, for the awareness of all senators and the witness, Ranking Member Cassidy and I have reached an agreement where we will both have an equal amount of time to ask the witness questions, and all other members will have seven minutes to ask the witness questions. Uh, our sole witness today is Mr. Lars Jorgensen. Mr. Jorgensen has been with Novo Nordisk since 1991 and was appointed president and CEO of the company in January 2017. 
Mr. Jorgensen, thank you very much for being with us. You may proceed with your testimony. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy. Oh, sir, make the, sure the mic is on there. Uh, it is on. Maybe I'll move this. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. much better. Okay. Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, Senators, thank you for the opportunity to speak again before the Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee on behalf of Nord Nordisk. Last year, I was asked to testify about patients living with diabetes and insulin affordability. This year, I volunteered to appear before the committee on policy solutions for patients living with obesity and the challenges they face navigating the complex U.S. healthcare system. I appreciate the opportunity to engage here today. For decades, our public discourse about obesity and to some extent type 2 diabetes was based on misinformation and blame. These conditions were treated as a personal choice a failure of willpower. No one was talking about how these are chronic diseases and treatable diseases. With the discovery of semaglutide and the development of Ozempic and Wegovy, our collective understanding of these diseases fundamentally changed. But this shift was not a foregone conclusion. This was a long and winding road. It, became, it began more than 100 years ago when our company was born. Monos was founded on the mission to not only treat but defeat diabetes to one day find a cure. And it was built on the idea that our success must be measured by looking at more than our financial sustainability, but also our societal and environmental sustainability. To this day, Monos maintains its unique ownership structure that protects its mission. The Monos Foundation is among the top three largest foundations in the world, rivaling the Gates Foundation and it serves as our controlling shareholder. For over, a, for over 100 years, the Foundation has supported initiatives that improve health and sustainability of the planet. This ensures that our time and resources are focused on unlocking cures for chronic diseases. Mr. Jorgensen, can you push pull that microphone a little bit closer to yes. you? Sorry about that. Is it better can, now? And can you work on a medicine for bad hearing? Okay, you know, that yeah, well, be the next thing. It's not really our expertise, but uh, maybe one day. <laughs> This ensures that our time and resources are focused on unlocking cures for chronic diseases, not on daily stock fluctuations. And our focus on this mission is how Ozempic and Wegovy came about. In the early 1990s, Nordic scientist Dr. Lotte Bjerg Knudsen, then a junior researcher in our labs, set out to take a hormone that naturally decays in the body within minutes and to make it last long enough to become a medicine to combat diabetes. It took years before she and her team evolved and solved that puzzle, and more than a decade longer to turn the research into, into Lorectotide, our pioneering once daily GLP-1 medicine. After this discovery, many believed that innovating beyond Lorectotide was at best unnecessary and at worst impossible, including most of our competitors. However, another tenacious team of Illinois scientists refused to give in. In November 2004, these scientists created 12 milligram of semaglutide, an even more potent molecule to combat diabetes. Even after that, it was still 14 years more in the making until Ozempic was finally approved, and another four years after that until Wegovy was approved. And we didn't stop there. In 2017, we launched the largest clinical trial in the history of the company, enrolling more than 17,000 patients across 41 countries. We demonstrated semaglutide's dramatic reduction in mortality for those suffering from cardiovascular disease and living with obesity. And because of our commitment to health discovery, we can now say that Lorectotide is the only weekly GLP-1 on the market that is FDA approved to reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, which is the number one cause of death in America. Today, we are also conducting even more clinical trials to understand how semaglutide may affect and treat chronic kidney disease liver disease, and Alzheimer's disease. But we know these discoveries are only effective if, if patients can access them. So along with discovering revolutionary medicines, we have committed to expanding manufacturing capacity. It took over 50 years to advance our science and manufacturing capacity for insulin production to meet demand. Today, we can provide insulin to nearly 30 million patients. But patients living with type 2 diabetes and obesity can't wait another 50 years. That is why, since the beginning of last year, we have committed over $30 billion to expand manufacturing capacity. 
to put the $30 billion in perspective, this is 20% more than the entire U.S. space program. It's also four times the amount that Congress has set aside for national electrical vehicle charging network. Our commitment includes $4 billion in new investments to expand our facility in North Carolina, on top of the $5 billion we have already invested there, creating thousands of construction jobs and manufacturing jobs in the state. We spend, the, we spend these resources because we can't afford not to. Type 2 diabetes costs the U.S. approximately $413 billion every year, and obesity costs the U.S. $1.7 trillion. And we all know the physical and emotional toll these diseases make. You have said that our amazing medicines can't help patients if they can't afford them. That is true. It is also true that the full value of a Simpic and Wigo can only be realized if patients can access them. Patients need both affordability and access. That is why we afford to secure public and private insurance coverage for patients with type 2 diabetes and patients with obesity. We're pleased to say that Ozempic is covered by 99% of all commercial plans by Medicare and by Medicaid in 50 states. And while Wegovi was only recently approved by the FDA in 2021, today it's covered by half of the commercial plans as well as over 20 state Medicaid plans, the Department of Veterans, Veterans Affairs and the military, the Indian Health Service, and for all federal employees, and hopefully soon for seniors. With that said, it is clear that patients too often struggle to navigate the complex U.S. healthcare system. It is also clear that no single company alone can solve such vast and complicated policy challenges. So what I can promise is that NUNORS will remain engaged and work with this committee on policy solutions to address the structural issues that harm patients and drive up cost. And I can also commit that we'll never stop driving change to defeat serious chronic diseases like obesity and obesity. I appreciate the committee's focus on, the, on ensuring patients living with chronic diseases can have affordable access to the medications they need, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Jorgensen. Um, Mr. Jorgensen, this committee and you and others have talked a lot about list prices. You make the point that we have a complicated system, and you're certainly right. So we talked about list prices. We've talked about rebates. We've talked about net prices. But at the end of the day, under your best case scenario, the price you are charging Americans for Ozempic is still nearly $600. That's with all of the rebates and all of the discounts. That's over nine times as much as people in Germany pay for the product. And the price you are charging for Wagovi to Americans is over $800, nearly four and a half times as much as it costs in Denmark. So very briefly, and a number of people are going to be asking you questions, please tell me why you think it is appropriate to charge Americans nine times more for the same exact product that you sell in Germany. And by the way, correct me if I am wrong here, but I assume that when you sell Ozempic for $59 a month in Germany, you are making a profit there. Am I correct on that? So, Senator, let me start by uh, acknowledging and sharing your wish to have affordable medicines for Americans. And, uh, there's been a number of uh, numbers mentioned here, and I think it's, it's important to say that these are not comparable uh, data. Um, when I mentioned that it's really, really important for us to secure access uh, to patients and affordability, uh, we are hard at work in making sure that patients have access via the insurance schemes. And today, 80% uh, of all Americans with insurance have access to these medicines at $25 or less uh, for a month's supply. So, so it's a price point at the pharmacy counter we have to talk about. Let me just interrupt you if I might, okay? You're correct that many people pay $25 a month for a Zempic. But what you're forgetting to mention is that many of those people are paying outrageously high prices for the insurance that covers Ozempic and other drugs. So simply this is a pass-through to the insurance companies. 
Bottom line is you are charging the American people substantially more for the same exact drug than you are charging people in other countries. And my question is why? So, Senator, uh, I appreciate the question. Let me try to uh, explain how I see it. Um, we launched uh, Ozempic in 2018. Um, we have had it on the market for, for some years. Uh, during those years, our price has declined by 40%. Um, I mentioned that patients with insurance have access uh, to, to the $25 uh, or less uh, for 80% of the cases. And if you look in this period uh, in Medicare where there's uh, broad coverage, uh, premiums have not gone up. In the same period, uh, the insurance companies and their PBMs, the big conglomerate of uh, uh, illegal entities they have, have more than doubled, actually close to tripled their profit. So the fact that we can actually secure that 99% of people with insurance have access, that there's a copay at the pharmacy of $25 or less without premiums going up in Medicare, while profit goes up for, for the middlemen, I think is a concerning uh, data point. Well, I would simply say <laughs> that most Americans would be surprised to learn that insurance rates are not going up. In my state, they're going up by 14 percent. But once again, you are not answering my question. It's a very simple question. In Germany, it, uh, in Germany, they're paying $59 for Ozempic. In the United States, we pay $969. And again, even with all of the discounts, we are still paying very substantially more than the people of any other country. And you are selling, as I understand, that 72% of your revenue comes from the United States. Is that right? Roughly? If it's based on our accounts, uh, you're right. I don't have the number from the top of my head. So you're selling, you're making huge amounts of money in this country, and you're charging us far more. Uh, and you haven't given me an answer as to why. Let me ask you another country, uh, question. Uh, a recent study from Yale University has estimated, as I mentioned earlier, that 40,000 lives in America could be saved each and every year if Novo Nordisk substantially reduced the price of Ogovi and made it available to everyone who needs this drug at an affordable price. Um, from a moral perspective, does it bother you knowing that keeping the price of Ozempic and Ogovi so high in the United States could lead to the preventable deaths of tens of thousands of Americans? So, Senator, we are very committed to make sure that Americans have access at affordable price point for our medicines. There's no thing we would rather uh, see happen. We, we, we have just announced uh, 30 billion investments to uh, increase capacity to serve these patients. Um, there is a market uh, we have to operate in and uh, we uh, negotiate uh, uh, hard to make sure that Americans have access we negotiate against the PPMs and give them significant rebate discounts and fees. Mr. Jorgensen, you're not answering the question. And, and look, I, as you may know, I'm a great respecter of the people of Denmark. Uh, I think you have a social system which is very progressive. But I'm asking you a simple question as a decent human being. What studies tell us is that because of the very high price of your products, 40,000 people a year may die in America. And you have not. The increased production is fine. But what I am asking you is, if you don't act, 40,000 people a year could die. Is this acceptable to you? Senator, any prospects of patients not getting access to the medicine they need, I think, is, uh, is terrifying. Uh, and we uh, have to solve this challenge together. I mentioned in my opening that I don't think any one company can solve that alone. I wish uh, there were more at the table today so we could have a discussion about how we do that together. We, we don't decide the price for patients. Um, that's set by, by the insurance companies. I do acknowledge, acknowledge that there are patients who have uh, poor insurance or no insurance. And if you in the U.S. do not have insurance. If you have a low income, we actually have support programs to help those patients. I'm proud about those, but they, they are not a real solution because 
patients should have access to medicines via insurance because if you live with a chronic disease like type 2, type 2 diabetes or obesity, these are complex diseases that requires access to physicians. There are comorbidities you need to have treatment for. Uh, so it's, I strongly believe we need to solve this within insurance. And when you are in insurance, uh, there, there is access to our medicine. Well, Mr. You know, Mr. Jorgensen, this committee has heard from insurance companies. We've heard from PBMs. We've heard from everybody in the world. Everyone blames everybody else. But you still have not answered my question. It's a very simple question. Why Novo Nordis is charging Americans substantially higher prices for these drugs than the people in other countries. Let me get to another issue. Mr. Jorgensen, you have told this committee that you are concerned that if you substantially lowered the list prices of Ozempic and Wagovi in the United States, PBMs may take these drugs off of their formularies and deny access to the patients who need these drugs. I think you used insulin as an example of that. However, I have received commitments in writing from the major PBMs that if Novo Nordis lowered its list price, they would not limit access to Ozempic and Wagovi and would not take these drugs off of their formularies. Given this fact, will you commit today that Novo Nordis will substantially reduce the list price of these drugs in the United States so that the American people are not paying higher prices, far higher prices, for these drugs than the people in Europe and Canada. So thank you, Senator, for, for that uh, information. That's new information for me. Uh, anything that will help patients get access to affordable medicine will be happy to look into. I'd just like to make a comment uh, also that uh, the experience, as you also allude to yourself, from insulin is one of when we uh, had a discussion last year in, in, the, in the hearing on insulin, we actually lowered uh, insulin pricing. That had a consequence. So when we dropped some of the insulin prices, uh, we uh, had our products dropped from formulary coverage. So less patients got access to those insulins. So I have a bit of uh, concern how this could play out, but anything that can help patients get access to the medicines they need at affordable price point will be happy to collaborate around that. Are you prepared to have Novo Nordisk sit down with the PBMs who have made that commitment to me that they will not take your products off of the formulary, sit in a room with us and work on an agreement? I'll be happy to, uh, as I said, do anything that helps patients. And I don't know under which conditions such a promise uh, comes. Uh, I haven't seen uh, any of that. Okay, I will get you the, the, they're in writing and I'll get you the yeah. letters. Um, all right, that's it for me right now. Uh, Senator Cassidy, did you want to ask? I'll defer to, I'll defer to Senator Collins for her seven minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Senator Cassidy. Mr. Jorgensen, you testified that the net price of what your company is actually paid for Ozempic has declined by about 40% since its introduction. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. But the question remains, how do we get relief to patients at the pharmacy counter? As Senator Cassidy has mentioned, this committee's examined the role of the middlemen, the PBMs, in inflating costs. And more than a year ago, in May of 2023, our committee reported a comprehensive bill that reformed PBM practices. And the whole purpose of that bill was to ensure that consumers got relief at the pharmacy counter. Unfortunately, the Senate Majority Leader and the Chairman have not brought that bill to the Senate floor in more than a year. Could you give us some indication of what the impact on costs to consumers would be on prices if we had enacted that PBM reform bill? Yeah, thank you, Senator, for, for that question. Um, 
if we look at it today, um, PBMs and their insurance companies, or I think in typical insurance companies that own the PBMs and a number of legal entities uh, set up to extract fees uh, from, from, from the U.S. system, they are rewarded based on list price. So they get a fee based on list price. So the higher list price, the more fee they get for the same job, which means that in our experience, products that comes with a low list price get less coverage. It's less attractive. And uh, that becomes troublesome for patients because patients who do not have insurance or have high deductible plans are then asked to pay the list price. We pay on average 74% in rebates, discounts and fees, uh, and even more when we are into Medicaid, uh, 340B, etc. So if we did our business based on net price instead of list price, that would mean that our products would be much more affordable for patients. And if we simply paid the PBMs a small fee for the limited risk and contribution they make, uh, I think patients would be significantly better off. So for every dollar that you sell in medicine, how much of that dollar goes to rebates, fees, and discounts that largely do not get passed on to the patient? Yeah, for every dollar we make, uh, we give 74 cents to the PBMs, insurance companies. So 74 cents of every dollar. Yeah. Let me uh, switch to an, another issue just to make sure that I understood. In your opening statement, you seem to say that your largest shareholder is a nonprofit charitable foundation. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh Let me turn to another issue. Recently, your company discontinued production of Levamir, and that is a popular, long-lasting basal insulin. Ironically, just yesterday, I heard from a mother from Denmark, Maine, whose daughter takes Lemavir and feels that it has unique benefits for her clinical situation. So making a sudden switch or change in her medication is very much of concern to this mother. What led to this discontinuation? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Any, any decision to stop supplying a medicine is a very difficult decision uh, because we acknowledge that different patients have, have different needs. Um, in the case of Levemir, we actually lowered the list price in the U.S. by 65% uh, last year. Uh, just to realize that after we dropped the price of Levemir, the uh, PBMs dropped coverage. So it went from being on 90% of insurance schemes to being only on some 35%. So we see a dramatic uh, lowering of volumes. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening, we serve uh, 30 million uh, people living with uh, type 1 diabetes in need of insulin. And it's difficult for us to run high volume manufacturing lines with small products because it prohibits us from actually serving all those patients. So it was a, a difficult choice we had to make to make sure that we could sustainably supply enough insulin for all people with type 1 diabetes, but I do acknowledge that it comes at a, uh, with some stress for individual patients, unfortunately. Well, I hope that you will be giving guidance to these families because for some of them this is a real blow and they're very concerned about the impact. I want to go back to the cost issue, which is critically important. How does your company help individuals who are part of low-income families, do not have insurance, and simply cannot afford your drugs? Yeah, if, thank you, Senator. Um, it's important for us that we also try to help the most vulnerable patients. Uh, so we have uh, worked hard to make sure that's coverage in, in Medicaid uh, for our, our medicines. And we also have patient support programs. So, for instance, if you live with type 2 diabetes and you are in need of a product like Ozempic, uh, you can contact Novo Nordisk. And if you 
make less than 400% of the national poverty line, which as illustration is uh, $120,000 as a household income, you can get uh, free Ozempic from Nord Nordisk. And I believe we're the only company uh, having such a support program. So if your household makes less than 120000 you can participate in your patient assistance program. Yes. And I, 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 I don't think it's an ideal situation because, honestly, um, patients should have access to insurance because if you live with type 2 diabetes, you're also at risk of having cardiovascular disease, kidney disease. So you need a, a range of, of medical support. So I think we should have as a shared objective, we really make sure that people have access to proper insurance. And when they have that, we can work with uh, different uh, mechanisms to make sure that when they're at the pharmacy counter, they can pick up our medicines for $25 or less in most cases. Uh, but that's difficult you. when you don't have insurance. My time has expired. Thank you. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, thank you for being here, sir. Uh, in your opening statement, you said, quote, patients need both affordability and access. I very much appreciate you, you saying that. Now, Wagovi and Ozempic are groundbreaking drugs that are making a huge difference in people's lives. The ability to quiet food noise and successfully manage their weight after so many failed attempts is truly a life-changing innovation. But to make a positive difference in people's lives, they have to be able to afford it as well. I've heard from New Mexicans about unaffordability. I'll share a story that I heard from Bernadette. She's a mother of three in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In October 23, Bernadette was prescribed Wagovia for diabetes and a liver condition. Her insurance denied coverage of Wagovia three times. Bernadette's Wagovia prescription would have cost about $1,000 after a $300 discount. Her doctor then prescribed Ozempic after two appeals. Bernadette's health insurance company approved her prescription. Even with health insurance, Bernadette's Ozempic prescription would have cost around $1,000 a month. Bernadette made the difficult decision to not pay $12,000 annually for either Wagovi or Ozempic, both prescriptions prescribed by her doctors. She now goes without. According to JAMA, the adult Hispanic population in the United States has a 45.6% obesity incidence. Black and Hispanic people are more predisposed to having type 2 diabetes a condition related to obesity. The median household income in New Mexico is $62,268, or $5,189 a month. The median household income for Hispanic families across the United States is $65,540, or $5,461 a month. Even with a 40% reduction in the list price, the cost of these drugs represent a huge part of the monthly income of New Mexicans and Hispanic Americans. I also heard through your testimony the, uh, the coupons or things of that nature that are included from the list price. Why don't you just sell the drug at the coupon price if you're willing to give people a coupon that can afford it instead of that list price that we see on that board? Thank you, Senator, for uh, bringing up that question and, uh, and also addressing uh, this, you know, the needs of of Hispanic and black populations. Uh, I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, it is not our intention that anyone should pay the list price. Um, the list price is the starting point for our negotiation against the PBMs and, and insurance companies in bringing uh, coverage of our medicines to, to, to patients, and in particular those you, you, uh, you mentioned here in, in having a bigger need. Um, we, we see that when there is insurance company coverage, there is uh, a price point of the $25 I mentioned for 80% of, of patients. And you can say, what about the remaining 20%? Uh, the price point is if $50 or less for 90% of the cases, then, then there are remaining 10% where there are either uh, a situation without insurance or you can say low-quality insurance where insurance schemes have high deductibles uh, or, or certain uh, restrictions on, on use of, uh, 
of, of the products. And it's important for me to say we, we don't set the price for those patients. That's a, that's a function of the insurance scheme. But for those who fall outside of insurance and uh, actually including the income level you mentioned, we have uh, for, for Simpic uh, a support program where we try to help them. Well, and Mr. Chairman, if I may, Mr. Jorgensen, Bernadette had insurance. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't afford it. No. Um, so I appreciate the statistics and the numbers. She's a real person, mother of three. Um, there's a problem here. I've, I've, I've not quite understood the notion of list prices with pharmaceutical companies and then the price that they're willing to sell the drug at so they can still make a profit. This sounds like a game to me and a game that I don't understand, but a game I certainly open a bipartisan way that we can get to the bottom of. I very much appreciate uh, Senator Collins' line of questioning at the opening as well. Legislation that's moved out of this committee deserves to be heard on the floor, and I certainly hope we can get there. I'm going to move on. Um, before I do, while I appreciate very much that the Indian Health Service and the VA include coverage for obesity and for other reasons of this drug, it's still high. It's still a high cost. Um, and when we look at those programs as a whole, I'm still very concerned as to what's happening in that space, but I look forward to visiting with your team more about that into the future. Um, Mr. Jorgensen, um, because of the work that was done with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, Medicare can finally negotiate the price that seniors pay for prescription drugs in Medicare. In your written testimony, you have acknowledged that Ozempic may be listed in the uh, negotiations uh, due to its high cost. Despite these contentions that Medicare negotiation will resolve the price, Novo Nordic has attempted to block the law when Medicare sought to negotiate the prices of insulins. These insulins, by the way, had the list prices of almost $6,000 annually. Now, as we both know, the court rejected that as well. My question for you, Mr. Jorgensen, when you mentioned in your written testimony that you expect Ozempic, your diabetes product will be included in Medicare's list of drugs for negotiations, yes or no, should Ozempic be selected for negotiation, will you commit to not initiating legal action to stop it? So, Senator, thank you for, for bringing up that question. Uh, so, we share the objective of uh, making products accessible and affordable for patients. No doubt about that. Um, on the uh, IRA uh, negotiation, we have had some concerns that if, uh, if, it's, a, if it's a real negotiation, I, I support that. But if it's a, a price setting, I, I think it will have unintended negative consequences uh, to access to, to patients uh, for, for innovation. So it's, uh, it's been described as a negotiation, but it's actually a setting of a maximum price. So I don't know what price we'll end up having for our insulins. I don't know if the PBMs, if PBMs will include it on formulary at all because of that lower price and impact on, on rebating. So I have nothing against negotiating pricing with the objective of improving affordability for patients uh, but if it's not a, a, a fair negotiation, but actually price setting, I think it will have negative consequences on the uh, innovation being brought uh, to Americans. Mr. Chairman, as I close, my time has expired. Um, I would remind you, Mr. Jorgensen, of those words that you used in your opening statement again. Patients need both affordability and access. I certainly hope that that rings true, and I would encourage you to sit down with Chairman Sanders and the committee staff associated with that PBM letter to find a place where you will lower those prices and do the right thing and send the message to everyone because your drugs will save people's lives. 40,000 more people that can't get them today, many in the community that don't get them today, and I certainly hope we can get to that place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cassidy. I'll defer to Senator Budd. Yeah, thank the ranking member. Thank the chair. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, thank you for being here. Uh, according to reports, the North Carolina State Health Care Plan attempted to limit coverage of um, one type of obesity drug, the, the GLP-1s that we're talking about today, um, for enrollees to avoid raising premiums. Now, however, CVS Caremark, the state health care plan's PBM, uh, informed them that they would lose $54 million in discounts if coverage was limited. So, Mr. Jorgensen, do you know if these allegations are true? Um, 
I have to admit I don't know all the details of the specifics in North Carolina, but I, I don't think we uh, stopped paying uh, these uh, rebates. So I received a letter from North Carolina Speaker of the House, uh, Tim Moore, and it includes data on the state health plans board of trustees blaming the Inflation Reduction Act, not drug spending on the plan's shortfalls. So I ask unanimous consent to enter the letter into the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, could you describe in, in as simple terms as possible how federal programs like the 340B drug discount program uh, and reimbursement for prescription drugs through Medicare Part B actually lead to higher prices? And I would say higher list prices. Yeah. Well, we, um, when, we, when we set a list price, we have to take into consideration what are the rebates we have to, to pay because unless we pay rebates into the system uh, to when we negotiate against the PBMs, we're not getting ex access to the formulary. So uh, a high list price is more likely to lead to more access to patients. And on top of that comes additional uh, payments we have to give when we are in Medicaid, when we are in 340B programs, etc., where there are additional uh, payments we have to make to make uh, products afford affordable. So it leads to higher prices for those patients who then do not have access via insurance or some of these programs because they are faced with a list price. And really, uh, nobody should pay the list price because that's not uh, how we intend to do business. But we don't control the price set for the patients. That's done uh, by the insurance schemes. We only negotiate against the PBMs to make sure that we can move uh, products uh, to patients but whether patients get insurance coverage and what pay, what price they pay, uh, we have no impact on. It seems like an industry with a lot of strange incentives. You know, last November, uh, the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, PBMs often favor drugs with higher list prices. Um, and I appreciate my colleague, Senator Collins' line of questioning. Um, but the favoring drugs with higher list prices is because PM, PBMs are reimbursed based on a percentage of the drug's list price, as I understand it. That means PBMs are going to make more money if they cover the higher, uh, higher price drugs. So here's, for an example, insulin. One type of insulin had a list price of $274, while an unbranded version of the same insulin had a list price of $25. And even though the unbranded version was $250 cheaper, the PBM uh, didn't cover the cheaper version. So and my understanding is only half of Americans have insurance coverage for that cheaper insulin. So this is a direct result of PBMs facing, facing uh, or favoring the more expensive type of insulin. So I understand and I appreciate your, um, your statement earlier that whatever's best for patients. And I, I believe that, you and the, the many great team members that you have at Novo. So Mr. Jorgensen, are there ways to reduce these perverse incentives. We're asking for suggestions here. Perhaps this will come in uh, ongoing discussions with the committee. But in your time here, do you have some suggestions to reduce these perverse incentives to deliver savings and value to the patients in need? Thank you, Senator. Um, we should really unite around what help patients. And uh, if you have uh, the industry making big risks in R&D, making big commitments into manufacturing, and then we have to negotiate against PBMs and their insurance companies not taking much risk and yet uh, benefiting from a significant fee linked to the list price. I think that's absurd. So uh, if we could stop linking their income to a list price, uh, I think that would create an incentive uh, that is not as absurd as it is today. I would prefer doing business on the net price where I compete against competitors based on what is the real price for our medicine and what is the value of the medicine. And these are medicines that are addressing uh, societal challenges that are paramount. And we talk about the cost of the, the medicine, but it's, it's really the cost of the diseases that's breaking uh, the system. And uh, we have to find a way where we transact uh, in a way where it becomes much more transparent what is the real price of the medicine to really adopt the medicine and mitigate the societal costs that diabetes and obesity is putting on the U.S. healthcare system and economy. 
as you observe kind of outside looking in, um, what changes would you suggest uh, that we consider to move from a list price scenario so where you could, and other companies and competitors even, could compete on a net price scenario? And do you believe that would be better for patients? Yeah, if we if we passed on the rebates we uh, pay uh, to the PBM uh, and the insurance companies and group purchasing organization, whatever they're called, if we pass that on to patients, uh, then they are faced with a net price at the pharmacy counter. Uh, I think that would dramatically change it to uh, a much more affordable system, where it's it's the value of the medicine uh, for the patient, the prescriber. Uh, that determines what products is being used, not uh, who gives the highest rebate. Uh, so uh, anything that opens up transparency and make it, you know, really competitive in, in a free market context where you compete on, on price and value of, of medicines, I, I think would be a, a great benefit for, for American citizens. Thank you. Chairman. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you for holding this important hearing about outrageous prices that Americans pay for prescription drugs compared to the rest of the world. I remain deeply concerned that pharmaceutical companies continue to put profits over patients. Patients deserve access to affordable prescription drugs. We have taken meaningful steps to lower prescription drug costs. For example, working with uh, Chairman Sanders and other members of this committee, we secured commitments from three companies to cap the cost of asthma inhalers at no more than $35 per month out of pocket. Moreover, by allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices for the first time uh, ever, 150,000 Wisconsinites will soon see significant savings on 10 of the most widely used and costly medications. Insulin is now capped at $35 per month for Medicare patients, and next year out-of-pocket costs will be capped at $2,000. But there is much more work to be done, and I'm committed to working with my colleagues to find more ways to lower the cost of prescription drugs and hold pharma pharmaceutical manufacturers accountable for outrageous prices. Um, today, I would like to begin by discussing patient access to medications. Mr. Jorgensen, your company was originally founded to provide insulin to patients with diabetes. For diabetic patients, the inability to uh, access insulin can be life-threatening. Without access to their prescribed medications, patients would be left to scramble to find alternatives or they would be faced with rationing their supplies. Mr. Jorgensen, you and your company have attributed shortages of your products, including uh, GLP-1s and insulin, to manufacturing capacity. Um, you have noted in your testimony that the overwhelming majority of your company's ma recent manufacturing investment is to expand production of GLP-1 medications. However, there have been reports of looming discontinuation of insulin products and ongoing shortages of insulin products. So is Nord Novo Nordisk shifting excuse me, is Novo Nordisk shifting manufacturing capacity away from insulin to prioritize manufacturing of GLP-1 drugs? Thank you, Senator, for raising these important questions. And you are right, we have a, a hundred year history in, uh, in diabetes. We are committed as ever to diabetes. We are one of very few companies who are still doing uh, research in, in insulin. We actually have, a, a, I would say, a breakthrough insulin being reviewed by the FDA, and we hope to launch that in the US market in a couple of years. So, so we are com as committed to insulin as we have always been. Um, when there's been uh, challenges uh, in, in supply, uh, it's not because we are taking uh, capacity away. Um, there is a market now where insulin pricing is going down dramatically. Uh, I'm concerned about the long-term supply of insulin because we have a 100-year commitment to that and we will keep uh, producing insulin. Uh, but I think it's becoming 
difficult for new companies to get in. I think it's very difficult for biosimilar manufacturers to get into this market because they can simply not get on formulary. Um, so uh, right now, insulin pricing is declining still by 10, 20% year over year. If this market structure continues, uh, it'll be challenging to, to supply insulin. And this is in, in dire contrast to the public uh, narrative around insulin price going up. So if it's dramatically going down for manufacturers, biosimilars are not willing to start producing insulin and cost goes up for patients. I think that's a good example of how this system is not working. But to answer your question, we will keep producing insulin. We are committed to patients in need of insulin. Um, how will your company ensure that the manufacturing capacity for critical insulin uh, products remains stable within your company? I know you were talking a lot about uh, other companies, but how will, we, uh, how will you ensure that manufacturing capacity within Novo Nordisk remains stable? That's a commitment we have made, a priority we have made in the company. And I mentioned the discontinuation of Levimir as a, a difficult choice to make because when a product is going down significantly in volume, it actually ends up, you can say, destroying the ability to produce enough on the line because every time you have to produce a different product, you lose capacity. So we, we focus our manufacturing to make sure that we can still supply uh, the, the 30 million people around the world who need insulin from Novo Nordisk. And we continue to do research and development to make sure that people with type 1 diabetes, who I, I agree with what has been mentioned today, probably live the most difficult uh, life of all in terms of uh, having a life-saving medicine they rely on each and every day. And they need a company they can trust for supplying high-quality products that live up to FDA requirements, etc., and uh, we are committed to to do that. So I have your commitment that, uh, notwithstanding the uh, manufacturing capacity that you're creating for G GLP ones, that you will continue to have a focus on providing critical insulin. You will not reduce your manufacturing capacity in that area. The world market for insulin is actually declining. So there's less demand, but we are committed to supply uh, to the patient that has been using our insulin uh, for years, uh, also into the future. And we'll keep investing in innovation because using insulin is probably the most difficult pharmaceutical intervention patient does. So staying in range is, is difficult. Uh, and we have a major innovation in, uh, in weekly insulin coming, something most uh, physicians would say would be possible, impossible to do. Yet our committed researchers uh, cracked the code, and uh, we hope uh, we have a proof for that uh, in the U.S. in the coming uh, you know, year's time. And that will simplify how people who rely on, on insulin uh, can, can dose their insulin and take some of the fear away. Thank you. Senator Custody. I will defer to Senator Marshall. Thank you, Dr. Casty, and thank you, Chairman Sanders. Mr. Jorgensen, welcome, and thank you for attending this uh, hearing. Look, Novo Nordisk is not the villain in this story. Novo Nordisk is not the villain in this story. They're a hero. We should be here celebrating this miracle innovation that's responding to this diabetic epidemic we have in this country. It's a miracle drug. 38 million Americans with diabetes that we're helping out. This nation is spending 250, maybe 350 billion dollars a year treating diabetes, not to mention the loss of work. And here's a drug that's going to help us treat the problem. Now we all agree on this committee across the Senate that the cost of health care is too much and that prescription drugs are too high, especially the out-of-pocket expenses. But we need to figure out who the villain is. Who is the real culprit here? Who's making the money? So on this particular poster, you've said it once, you've said it twice, everybody up here has said the same thing. Whatever the cost is, whichever number we want to use, Nova Dordis keeps 24% of it, and the PBMs extract 76 
uh, 74%, 26% and 74%. So really the PBMs are making the bank here. So let's talk about PBMs for a second here. The real, the real culprit in this, in this room, in this story. So these three big parent companies, the three big PBMs control 80, 85% of the industry. Their gross revenue last year was $800 billion. Their parent companies, gross revenue, $800 billion. This committee's worked so hard on PBM reform. We've not passed our delinking bill, and I would ask the chairman to consider bringing the delinking bill back to the committee and let us mark it up as well. In that delinking bill, PBMs would receive a flat fee for their efforts as opposed to a percentage of the sale. So we'd go to a flat fee model. Number And next, there just can't possibly be enough transparency on this issue. You know, I came to Congress to save Medicare. The people of Kansas sent me here to save Medicare. I cannot save Medicare without a miracle drug for Alzheimer's. We're spending, I think, way over $200 billion on Alzheimer's disease. So if, if we thwart the innovation that, you're, that this type of company does, it tells people to stop researching drugs that are going to solve Alzheimer's. Um, Mr. Jorgensen, let's talk about research and development for a second. Uh, how many years have you been researching diabetes and then eventually you got, you know, probably decades ago, you started going down this ozemic path and how many other rabbit holes have you all been down? Yes, thank you, Senator, for, for the question. Uh, we have a 100-year research uh, effort in, in diabetes and uh, the, the past three decades uh, we have been uh, researching the GLP-1s, uh, in, in, uh, in starting in, in diabetes and then uh, in obesity. And when we started the obesity research efforts, everybody thought it was a stupid uh, idea. Yeah. I'm gonna, sorry to get through this. So you've spent three decades specifically on the GLP-1 model, and I'm sure that there was lots of molecules that didn't work out, and at the end of the day, you've spent in excess of $10 billion of research and then how much money are you going to spend on research this year, approximately? So we are spending approximately 14% of our turnover on, on research. Okay. I want to make a quick point here that companies like yours benefit from the Trump tax cut, the research and development dollars, the tax cut on that that expired. Is that true that you, that doing research in this country, you benefited from that tax cut? We, we have no, say, funding support from the NIH uh, whatsoever in our research efforts. We benefit from tax uh, benefits in, in different uh, situations. So the R &D, being able to write the R&D off over a year as opposed to five or ten years uh, would be a significant, uh, uh, would prevent you from, re or decrease your reinvestment opportunities. Yeah, perhaps. I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know the specific uh, data in terms of okay. how much we benefit okay. from it. You know, the one thing I am disappointed in your company, All Big Pharma, is the marketing that they do. Um, I think that the marketing is very influential. I really think that Congress needs to go back and revisit that as well. I think that uh, the marketing is so good. There's people on this drug that shouldn't be on it um, and are being taken advantage of. And so I do think we need to go back and look at that. Um, again, instead of coming after the hero of this story, we need to look in a mirror. America needs to look in a, in a mirror that nutrition is a big problem in this country and lack of activity. The chairman, ranking member, all of us have worked on community health center funding. I think that's where the opportunities to work on the nutrition problems remains. So it's frustrating to me that Congress can spend a trillion dollars on the military, Medicare can spend a trillion dollars, but we can't spend three billion dollars on primary care. $3 billion to address the primary care needs of this country, which I think would have a big impact on driving down the need for these type of expensive drugs. America, I said it for 20 years as a physician, that America suddenly wants drive-through health care. We want to drive through a fast food service that gives, me, uh, gives medicine to fix our problem rather than addressing the real challenges before us, which is our nutrition in this country is, is horrible. Um, so I think that's something we need to continue to work on. The other thing we can still work on is bringing competition. Promoting competition to you will bring this price down. 
We've passed legislation, the president signed legislation that helps drive biosimilars and ger- generics to market more efficiently. There are several in the, in, the near, in the hopper, so to speak, but still the FDA remains very inefficient. Very inefficient. The FDA should focus on the safety of the drugs and then let the physicians and the patient decide if they're right for them. And that type of a model will drive down that, that process by years. And I'll just close you know, one more time emphasizing that this committee needs to demand that the, the, the leader bring our PBM reform to the floor, but we need to include that delinking bill. There's other opportunities to drive this price down again. Again, Novus Nordic is not the villain in this story. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Senator Hassan. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and to you and Senator Cassidy for this hearing. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, this year, Novo Nordisk abruptly discontinued the drug Levimir. And I know Senator Collins raised this with you, but I want to follow up on on it a bit. Levimir is a critical insulin product and one of the few long-acting insulins approved for use during pregnancy. By discontinuing Levimir in January of 2024, Novo Nordisk interrupted the diabetes care plans of millions of Americans with only a few weeks' notice. Will Novo Nordisk agree to provide any interested company with the necessary information and drug formulation to make Levimir? Senator, thank you for the question. Um, any, any decision to... Uh, take a product off the market is a very, very difficult decision. And uh, I have to explain why we had to do that. We last year reduced the price for, for Levimir. We dropped the price, yet to find that uh, PBMs dropped access to Levimir. So uh, much less patients have access to it. I understand that, but my question is, now that you're not making it and there are still patients who need it, will you provide necessary information and drug formulation to other pharmaceutical companies that decide they want to make it? We have uh, given a year's notice uh, more than the weeks you mentioned. Sir, my question is a direct one. Please answer it or tell me you're not going to. We have collaborated and followed up with all those that were brought forward as potential manufacturers, but we have not found anyone interested in manufacturing it. And if there is a company interested in manufacturing it or the government wants to manufacture it, we'll be happy to collaborate. The reality is that the market is disappearing for Levimir because of how it's contracted. And I, 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 uh, I don't make a decision like that, uh, an, an easy decision. I, I understand, but and and have you worked actively to find a manufacturer to take on Levimir? It sounds like you've had some conversations, but are you continuing the outreach? Because there are some patients who really need this medication. Yes, um, the companies we know of uh, have not shown interest. All the companies that has been mentioned as potential partners on this, we have discussed with, and none have come forward as being interested. So um, I will follow up with you in writing to ask for specific steps that you will continue to take over the next, let's say, three months to find a manufacturer for this drug. Uh, I'd like to move on, if I can, because in response to a question from Senator Lujan about um, your pricing of um, Ozempic and uh, Wigovi, uh, you said if you drop the price of these obesity drugs, PBMs, would take them off their formularies. But here's what the PBMs say. Um, Cigna Express Scripts, the question they were asked is, if Novo Nordisk lowered the list price for Ozempic and Wegovi tomorrow and the net cost stayed the same or went down, would your PBM limit access? Here's what Cigna Express Scripts said. No, if Novo Nordisk lowered their list price for Ozempic and Wegovi tomorrow to a price that was the same or lower than current net cost, that change by itself would not result in less favorable formulary placement. To support this claim, the company provided an example. It did not disfavor a competing weight loss product, Eli Lilly's Zepbound, even as it launched at a list price 20% lower than Wigovi. Here's what United Health Group Optum RX said. No, assuming the net price remains the same or lower, lowering a medicine's list price would not lead to less favorable formulary placement by Optum RX, particularly for high demand drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy. To be clear, lower list prices and lower net prices support formulary placement and access. CVS Healthcare Mark said, 
something similar. It said the simple answer is no. In fact, we can point to recent history as a proof point. When Novo Nordisk drastically reduced the price of their insulin, Novolog, in 2023, it did not result in a less favorable formulary placement with Caremark. And they were also asked if Ozempic and Wegovi were available for $100 per month or less, what impact do you expect that it would have on coverage and access? Cigna Express says if Novo Nordisk lowered the price uh, for plan sponsors to $100 or less per patient per month, we would expect the vast majority of our clients to expand coverage and access to these products for diabetes and weight loss, assuming clinical evidence continues to support efficacy and safety. CVS said lower list prices would open up access for obesity treatment in particular. United Health Group Optumarx said given the significant price differential for these products across borders, a decision by Novo Nordisk to align U.S. pricing more closely with those in other countries would meaningfully increase access for U.S. patients. So with that in mind, would you please commit to lowering uh, the list price of these drugs. So, uh, Senator, allow me to share a few points before I answer your question. Yes. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, the experience we have is one of losing access when we lower price. I know you can always find specific plans that did include uh, insulin with a lower price, but the 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 broad, uh, say, totality is that less patients have as access to our medicines when we have lowered the price. I understand that perhaps the PBMs have changed uh, their mind, and I'll be happy to, to collaborate with them on this because anything that helps patients to get access and affordability, we are supportive of. And uh, we, uh, the, the, the rebates that were shown before, we hand those out. They are not in our books. So uh, if we can, we, we can go to a, a delinking model or any model where we, we do business based on net price, and I'll be more than happy for that. But it's not, it's not how history has told. Well, that. but you've, you've now got these co companies um, publicly committing uh, to continuing access and increasing access if the list prices are lowered. So um, I would strongly recommend that with these companies on the record, they represent a huge amount of the covered uh, patient population in the United States, uh, that you consider strongly uh, lowering the list price. Um, and uh, lastly, um, I just uh, want to note that um, one way of reducing drug prices is encouraging the entry of generic and biosimilar medications, which can provide lower cost options uh, for patients. So um, I will follow up with you to, I hope, get a commitment that Novo Nordisk will not stand in the way of other companies uh, coming up with lower cost versions of these drugs that are current, if the companies currently have them in development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to pick up on Senator Hassan's important point. We have in writing, we will certainly share it with you, commitments from the three major PBMs <clears throat> that if you substantially lower your list price, uh, they would not limit coverage. Now, what I'm hearing from you is that you are prepared, Novo Nordis is prepared to sit down and work with those three companies. I am prepared to negotiate that, work with you. Do I have your commitment that you will sit down uh, with the three companies to make sure that they keep that commitment. Yes, anything that can help patients get access, I'm, I'm supportive of, and that also includes uh, collaborating and negotiating with anyone who can help that. All right, but picking up on Senator Hassan's point, if in fact they keep their commitment, are you then prepared to substantially lower the list prices in the United States? I have to understand what this entails because uh, when I hear uh, statements that PBMs would accept a low list, pri list price product, it needs to go all the way to patients. So it means that they talk about insurance companies being their clients. It's actually their owners. So it needs to get to insurance schemes and it needs to get to the patients. Because, I, am, I am aware yeah, of that. Yeah. All right, but I'm asking you again. A, will you work with this committee and the PBMs? Yes. Number we, two, I, if I, in fact they keep their word, and I understand that it's complicated, will you in fact substantially lower list prices in this country? If it works in a way where patients get access to a more affordable medicine and uh, we have, uh, you know, 
certain see that it actually happens and not like when we lowered list price uh, prior rounds around that less people got access to our medicines. Right, I understand that. We, we, will, we will be uh, positive towards right. that. We will be in touch with you and the PBMs to work on this. And I want to thank Senator Hassan for that line of questioning. Uh, Senator Cassidy. I'll defer to Senator Romney. My goodness, Senator Cassidy, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, appreciate the chance to uh, uh, have this witness here. Appreciate your willingness to be here. Um, I don't know whether it's voluntary or not, but uh, uh, given the nature of our hearings, uh, which are mostly opportunities for us to talk and you to listen, uh, I appreciate your willingness to be here. Um, I, you know, I guess there were a couple of models that one could have for developing new drugs. Uh, one was the idea of a patent, which we'd say we want the private sector to invest massive amounts of money developing new products, new innovations, and then if one works, to have a patent to allow you to charge whatever you want to recoup a return on investment and make it potentially enormous profit. That's one model. The other model is to say, no, we the government are going to develop drugs and we're going to spend our money and, and, uh, and keep the price down. Sometimes we live in a fantasy land, which is we want you to invest and the industry generally to invest massive amounts of money, but then we want you to keep the prices low. Like, that, that's fantasy land. That's not real. That's not reality. You, you, under our system, are able to charge whatever you believe the market will bear and get as big a profit as you could possibly get. I, I presume that's the, the, the uh, you have taken, you're, you're a fiduciary for your shareholders. You're trying to maximize your profit. Is that right? Senator, I agree with you that I'm not aware of any the government has, that has developed a product. So it's typically done in, uh, in the private uh, sector. Yeah, yeah. And, and that can yeah. only happen if there's patent protection. I'm, I don't think we, we uh, set our price in a way where we uh, just look at, at our shareholders because we have also an obligation to set a price that it's uh, available and affordable for patients. Yeah, there's no question. Long term, uh, your, your profit is going to be enhanced if people believe that you are good guys, not bad guys. And, and so there are a number of considerations in the, considering what's the best return. But there are a number of folks that would like you to invest a lot, but then to limit what you can get back and somehow uh, ascribe malevolent uh, intent if, uh, if you charge a high price. It's like that's the system we have. There are alternative systems, which is, no, no, we're going to limit how much you can get back. In, I look around the world. I don't recall a lot of drugs coming from China and Russia and North Korea and Iran. We don't see a lot of innovation coming from there. But, yes, I would love a setting where you invested massive money, but then you gave us the products cheap. I mean, that, that's, just not, that's just not reality. And I, 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 I mean... I wish there were a way of that to happen, but I don't see how that happens, and I very greatly appreciate the innovations that have been made by the, uh, by the industry. I, I do wonder uh, what, the, what the reason is for the differences in price between what's available here in this country and what's available in some other countries. And, and I'm not now just talking about Wagovi and Ozempic, and I don't know the pricing differences to the extent they exist around the world. But we in this country often talk about how products are much cheaper in Canada and, and the UK and France and Germany than they are here. Why, why is that? Why are we so out of a line with the rest of the world in terms of the pricing that comes from the industry? Not necessarily your own company, but, uh, but the industry at, at large. Yes, I think there are sense of a, a number of differences when, if you, for instance, compare U.S. and European market. Um, if you look at all the innovation that's made, uh, a lot of it made in this country, so the economic activity taking place here. Uh, all of those innovative products uh, in 80%, 85% of the cases get to the market in the US. Uh, it's only around 40% in Europe. So in Europe, there's a, there's a sanction of healthcare. There's a rationing of who gets access. So the latest innovations are not getting to my countrymen. Uh, but they are in most cases getting to the U.S. So there's a different uh, perspective in how you, uh, you, you, you look at innovation. And when we look at the diseases we're talking about here, diabetes and obesity, these are very, very expensive diseases. And we talk about the cost of the medicine, but typically in these diseases, the cost of the medicine is less than 10% of the total disease burden. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, chronic kidney disease, 
where we have shown in our data that for people living with type 2 diabetes and start using Ozempic, you reduce the risk of developing chronic kidney disease by 24%. And actually a quarter of all Medicare cost goes to people living with kidney disease. So, so uh, using innovation is a really a big opportunity for driving down the cost uh, of the U.S. healthcare system. And there is a general openness for that type of innovation in the U.S. market, which is not always the case in Europe. And that comes with a cost, but it also leads to significant benefits for the individual Americans, but also for the healthcare system and saved cost for these chronic diseases. I would anticipate that in European countries that don't have access to some of the life-saving uh, products that are available here, that there would be a huge hue and cry on the part of the public saying, why can't we have these products? But those that are available in both places, I don't understand why the price should be different. Uh, if the French and the Germans and the, and the, uh, the Canadians honor our patents, would the companies not be free then to uh, uh, charge the same price there that they charge here? Why charge a lower price there? Uh, than is charged here? So it's a great question. When we compare the prices, uh, it's not an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. It's, it's typically different prices that's being compared, and it's, it's typically the list price in the U.S. Um, and in the U.S., there's not one price. Uh, there are a number of different prices. So I, when we sell our products in, in Medicaid, in VAs, we get a really, really low price. We even have support programs where we pay for the medicine for Americans. There are no other place where we uh, give products away for free. That's only in the U.S. When I look at the government, what the government pays for our insulins, that is now less than what many governments pay in, in Europe. Uh, but that's typically lost in the whole translation and referencing to, to list pricing, which is not the price we get. So unfortunately, as also the chairman said at the opening, it is a very complex uh, market and very complex healthcare system that creates uh, a lot of misunderstandings. Yeah, I, I must admit I, admit I agree. The complexity of our PBM system is such that it's very hard for us to figure out just exactly who's getting what and why. And, and I, I happen to believe that one of the reasons our health care cost is so expensive, particularly as it relates to pharmaceuticals, is the opaque nature of our pricing in this country. Thank you, Mr. Jorgensen. Uh, Senator Hickelnupa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jorgensen, for taking the time and uh, indulging us for all these questions. Uh, I think there's some unique histories in the United States uh, in terms of government's ability to negotiate prices. It, we don't have to go into that now, but it is a part of it. Certainly, we're, we're seeing PBMs come here, and they point the finger in one direction, and the large pharmaceutical companies point their finger in the other direction. I think most Americans hear that as a hustle, as a, a, a rigged game, and they're, they're, they're pointing, get, get it out of here. Uh, you look at di diabetes diagnoses, they're expected to rise considerably over the, the coming decades. By 2030, they're saying uh, 55 million Americans will have type 2 uh, diabetes. Uh, we could see a nearly 700 percent rise in the number of young people with type 2 diabetes in the next 40 years. Um, Obviously, this is a miracle drug, and I think by any measure we should recognize that right off the bat. Uh, and I think the point that, you know, the lower price, offering a lower price insulin made the access of that specific drug, Levomir or whichever ones it was, decrease by almost half or more than half. That should be frightening. And at some point we might want to figure out how to get the PBMs, representatives, and the pharmaceutical companies here together and let both sides in 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 an open discussion suggest solutions to this because it's it's not sustainable going forward. Uh, one point I want to make: we have a company in Colorado called Verta Health that's leading the way to ad address some of the issues around weight management um, uh, and long-term solutions to patients with type two diabetes. Um, and in a recent study, they provide coaches and and help people navigate what they're eating and what, when they exercise. Uh, Verda found that patients with type 2 diabetes who stopped taking a GLP-1 and remained on a nutrient or a nutrition therapy program did not regain, regain weight uh, after a year and had similar blood sugar control as those who were still on the drug. Now, obviously, many patients may have aggressive form of obesity. The appetites that, I don't know, you can argue that the appetites 
in people has evolved over the 90% of the time in our, in our evolutionary history. We were hunters and gatherers. So that's a very hard thing for, for many people to control. Um, but for those patients who can control it, uh, a company like uh, Verda Health can really provide benefits. Are you doing any studies to look at that of, 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 as a kind of a combined therapy or a, an alternative therapy that people can move on to that's less expensive? Yeah, thank you, Sensor. Uh, I think you raise a, a really good point that also alludes to that patients are different. We probably know of people who, uh, who live with, say, an aggressive form of obesity, and no matter what they do, they put on weight, and most likely they'll have to be on, on really efficacious uh, new innovations in the future to manage th their weight. But we might also get to know of uh, patient segments where uh, after efficacious treatment and perhaps with a coaching uh, solution, they can change lifestyle to a degree that uh, the coaching motivates them to reinforce that and they can do without medicine. It's, it's still uh, a bit early days, and I think we, uh, we have to acknowledge that for long we have looked at people with obesity and to some degree type 2 diabetes as, as a self-inflicted condition. Right. So I think we should be careful about saying that, you know, if you just get a coach and get this digital support, you're taken care of because then I think we're letting patients down in need of, of significant help. But I, I believe that there'll be a, a market for such a, 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 a solution and it can coexist with, with our products and it can also help take the burden off the healthcare system over time. So we don't want to move people on, on medicines and keep them medicines they do not need. Uh, but I also note that many Americans will need to have help of course, for a long time. And I raised I raise the question, I was specifically trying to make sure that there are different groups of people, and obviously the, the notion that we, everyone can control their appetites is ridiculous. And I think we've, we have disadvantaged people that, that are, have differing uh, uh, genetic makeup and, and physiological character. Uh, we uh, put them in unfair positions. Let me go off on a different uh, uh, direction. Uh, and talk a little bit about uh, sugar and, and, and diabetes and, and then some of the other issues that can arise. Um, roughly almost three-quarters of our food supply in the United States now is made of what we call ultra-processed foods. Um, researchers have started studying the possible connection between these ultra-processed foods uh, with higher rates of diabetes and then also dementia uh, later in life. And certainly researchers are still working to understand the exact connection here. So I'm not saying this is thought or has been consequentially defined. But there is evidence that diabetes can lead to a higher rate of inflammation as well as damaged blood vessels, which could impact cognitive functioning as we age. Can you speak on research that Novo Nordisk has done on testing the effectiveness of GLP-1s or GLP-like uh, pharmaceuticals in reducing the risk of dementia. Is the company, company have you guys got uh, research on this connection um, you know, that, that would, would be optimistic? Yeah, thank you, Senator. You raise a really, really good point. And uh, our GLP-1 medicine, uh, semaglutide, works in an anti-inflammatory way, which has uh, tremendous benefits uh, for, for, for patients. It not only lowers weight, but it also reduces risk of cardiovascular disease because of this anti-inflammatory properties. And we're now also testing it out in Alzheimer's disease, where we hope we can show in data end of next year that uh, being on this medicine uh, can bring uh, benefit for, for people with Alzheimer's disease. So this whole cardiometabolic disease state that is leading to a number of comorbidities is actually also a leading cause of number of cancers. We, uh, we aspire to show in continued massive investments in R&D that we can uh, document these benefits Great. and have them FDA approved. Great, thank you. And I, I'll just to end with the, um, in terms of the whole tenor of the discussion, that uh, Henry Ford was famous for coming in and actually dramatically reducing his prices so as to dramatically increase volume and uh, dramatically succeeded at a level that nobody really imagined. And I think you, with a miracle drug like this, you might have that same potential where actually lowering the price could dramatically change not only the, the success of the, of the pharmaceutical, but also the success of the business. Senator Cassidy. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Jorgensen. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, you had mentioned that, uh, just to clarify for the record, that Ozempic would be available with a patient assistant for, uh, program, a PAP, if they were insured but they had a high deductible. You did not mention that for Wagovi. So if, I, if a patient has a high deductible and or has a health savings account is, and they want, they're taking Wagovi for obesity, is there a patient assistant program for them uh, is, or some other assistance for them to be able to afford? Yeah, so first to clarify the, what we have on Ozempic, um, if, you, if you have uh, an income less than 400% of the national, national poverty line, you can qualify for free uh, Ozempic. Uh, if you have a high deductible plan, unfortunately, when you're inside insurance, if you, if you actually got, a, uh, say, a, a product for free from Nord Nordisk or you, you, you bought it at, a, say, a, a cash program, the insurance company would not count that against your deductible. So it wouldn't help you. So well, wait a second, though. If I have a, health sa a high deductible health plan with a health savings account um, and say the drug is whatever it is, $900, um, and I've got a deductible of 2000 uh, let me make sure I understand this. One, that your patient assistant program would not assist them, um, and you're saying it's because... Uh, yes, our net price is whatever it is, six hundred dollars. We'd be willing to make it more affordable, but but that this would not the patient would not benefit. I, I lost you there. Yeah. I lost you there. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if you instead, uh, so so when you're in the deductible space, we have still given the rebate to the PBM, uh, but uh, it's not shared with the patient. And if you went out and bought, say, a lower-priced product because we also have a, a cash program, that spent uh, would not count against your deductible because you have, to, you have to spend that within, say, insurance. So it wouldn't help the patient. And that's a function of insurance scheme design. That's not something we, uh, we control. No, it actually would help the patient, on the other hand, because if she would be paying for, she would be paying much less, but now she's paying $900. But I think I'm hearing from you in the contract or contractual relationship that you have with the PBM, that actually seems to be what is first being considered is contractual relationship between your company and the PBM and not the bottom line for the patient. Because the bottom line for the patient, she's paying 900 bucks instead of nothing. Is that a fair statement? So, so Let's assume that she has less than 400% of federal poverty. So she's less than 400% of federal poverty. And, and she's got a high deductible plan and or a, a high deductible uh, HSA. So she would not qualify for the patient assistant program. She would not, but even if she did, she would still have the deductible. So well, she, I get that, but yeah. she would use that for another thing. She'd use that for an uh, urgent care visit as opposed to the drug benefit. Yeah, that's true. We, we feel it's, it's not appropriate to have deductible plans for patients living with chronic diseases that on an ongoing basis needs to have access to the health care. So when they come that, to the, the beginning... But that was a value judgment on the basis of the company for the patient. I'll just say that because oftentimes those policies are otherwise more affordable. Let me ask, if the patient is uninsured, if the patient is uninsured, would she qualify for this less than 400% of federal poverty being able to get the patient assistant program? Uh, yes, for the diabetes product, we have not yet established it for the obesity program. We have a cash offering at approximately half the price that patients can, can use. Um, we feel that right now where we are building uh, say insurance coverage and also negotiating uh, access to, to Medicaid. That's our focus, um, and uh, that's what we're giving priority to now in terms of uh, supporting patients. Let me move on. One of the tensions here that I mentioned is innovation versus um, is innovation versus the ability to afford. And I just want to, you know, echo what Marshall and Romney said, the fact that y'all and others are doing research on the impact of, of these drugs to prevent Alzheimer's is fantastic. I mean, this could possibly be part of what makes Alzheimer's less of a scourge. And that takes money. So when someone says they can produce it for $5, yeah, they can produce it for $5, but they're not going to produce the $30 billion worth of research that would find another indication f for how we go forward. So I think we need to acknowledge there is that. 
But it is my impression that the United States is paying for this research and that the other countries are not. I'm sure that uh, Chairman Sanders asked if you're making money in Germany. Of course you're making money in Germany. Uh, you're making money on the margin, but I don't think, I th I, it's my impression, if you will, that it's not the Germans who are paying for the ongoing research as to another indication. Uh, now, I say that. You don't have to respond to it, but I'm going to surmise that to be the case. The Trump administration proposed international reference pricing in which you took a market basket of developed countries, Germany, Japan, Great Britain, whomever, and you put them as a market basket and the U.S. would pay some multiple. Now, from my mind, that would force your company and others to go back to the Europeans and say, wait a second, no longer is the United States going to pay full freight for the research. You also have to contribute. They may pay a little bit more, but nonetheless, you have to pay a little bit more. Um, do you, what thoughts do you have about the international reference pricing that was proposed by the Trump administration? So, uh, Senator, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I think, again, uh, we need to really get into what is then the price we're talking about, because if you... Uh, okay, now, I will accept that you have to design it cor correctly, but I'm asking more about the concept. Uh, frankly, I think the Trump administration had kind of a... a, a there, there were some flaws with it. But if, but if you could address those flaws, what about the concept that, it, that there should be a market basket and if the U.S. is not going to pay uh, for all of the R&D, maybe more but not all, and that in effect this may force the companies to negotiate a little bit harder with the Europeans, um, conceptually what do you think about that? Um, I think it should be fair in who pays for innovation. Uh, I mentioned also before that uh, a significant of the innovation never is launched in Europe. So a number of the breakthrough therapies uh, only make it to Americans. So Americans benefit from... I accept the, that, yeah. but I'm going to come back to the concept. Let's assume that we could imagine a way in which you know, some of the flaws of the previous proposal were addressed. What about the concept... Of, yes, there'll be a market basket of developed countries that typically are paying, you know, full freight. It wouldn't be the PEPFAR program in Africa paying pennies on the dollar. And that the U.S. would pay some multiple, but it would be a lower multiple than we're currently paying. Uh, we'll be happy to look at that. Uh, I think we'll find that uh, the perceived multiple is much lower than we actually think. I just mentioned uh, the example of insulin today. The U.S. government pays less for insulin than uh, uh, Typical, uh, typical European governments, yet we talk about insulin being more expensive in the U.S. than it is in Europe. That's not the case for the manufacturer. So, so we need to decompose the complexity to get to what is the real price, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to, to contribute to I accept something. That. Like I also that. want to point out there's been a lot of faith being placed in PBM saying that they would pass through a lower price but I do want to point out on the 20th, the Washington Post had an article speaking about how the Federal Trade Com Commission has indicted the three largest PBMs uh, for uh, manipulating the price of insulin, and one of them said rebates is our sweet drink or something like that. And so, so I'm hoping that they would be sincere on that, but I will know. And by the way, they dispute that. PBMs are disputing this, but there was this file by the FTC. And uh, with the chairman's permission, I'll submit that for the record. Um, then my last question b before I move on, uh, before I kind of let others go, is um, I will stop there. Okay, I may have a second round, but I'll stop there. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to I pick up right there. Um, I am very proud of the work that this committee and Congress has done on the prescription drug pricing issues, the Inflation Reduction Act capping insulin, uh, capping and then progressively reducing out-of-pocket costs for folks under Medicare Part D, uh, negotiated pricing, supported all of those things. The great thing about the IRA, it passed by one vote, so I tell everybody I was the deciding vote on all of these matters. We were all the deciding vote, all of us who voted yes, and some of those provisions weren't loved by the pharmaceutical companies, but I voted for them and I'm, I'm proud of them. But um, I have come to conclude, along with a number of my colleagues, that uh, the focus on pharmaceutical companies is something I support. We're letting PBMs get away scot-free. One company, one, one industry, 
researches, one doesn't. One industry produces life-saving treatments, one doesn't. One industry is super duper profitable and another one profitable, but the one that's the super duper profitable is the one that's not doing any research and not producing any life-saving innovations. One industry is under fairly intense scrutiny by this committee in Congress and one isn't, and it's the one that's the super duper profitable one that is not researching and not producing products that is getting away scot-free. In May, of 2023, we passed a great bill out of this committee. I think it was actually four bills, and if I remember by memory, I think the votes were 18 to 3, 18 to 3, 19 to 2, and 20 to 1. Overwhelming bipartisan bills, finally, to regulate PBMs. And I'm disappointed that those bills haven't gone anywhere. I turn on my TV and I see the PBMs running all kinds of ads against Congress, telling Congress, you know, not to vote for the scary PBM reform bill. If we're going to bring prescription drug prices down even more, we shouldn't let up on having Mr. Jorgensen and other CEOs here and pressing them, but we got to get serious about the PBM reform piece of it. Mr. Jorgensen, you were here. I'm just going to go into this. You were here in May of 2023, and I asked you a question about the connection between list price and formulary placement. You and, and, and I will say, Chairman Sanders, this was the single best hearing I've attended in 12 years in the Senate, the hearing where you had both the PBMs and the pharmacy CEOs together because you're familiar with the phenomenon that everybody blames the party that's not in the room. We had them all at the same table. You and your two CEO colleagues testified that PBMs prefer the drug with the higher list price and it's difficult, if not impossible, to get a formulary placement for a drug with a lower list price. And that's because they often make a profit on the discount or rebate they can negotiate off a list price. And this perverse incentive artificially keeps drug prices too high. So then I followed up and asked this question to the PBM witnesses. And I asked about this. And as you might expect, they were not direct in their answer. I asked one witness, quote, so you do not have any fee structure in your company where you collect a fee based on the percentage of the list price? The response I received after a long pause, we certainly may have a few in our client base. Everybody in the room that knew that answer was a complete dodge, and that was over a year ago. Senators Marshall Tester and I have been working for over a year on a bill that would address this issue. The Drug Act would delink the list price of a drug from PBM profits in favor of a flat fee. We had hoped that might have been included in the markup this Thursday. I'm, I'm sorry that it won't be, but we're going to continue to make it happen. Color me skeptical that an industry that is now giving us pie in the sky statements about the, what they're willing to do, but that's, all, that's also buying advertisements on TV, trying to attack Congress for doing PBM reform. Color me skeptical that they're gonna come to the table and suddenly you know, have a conversion experience and start doing the right thing. But, but I guess one evidence of whether they're doing the right thing is since you were here in May of 2023, have PBMs changed their practices or are they continuing to favor higher price drugs on the formulary and make it difficult to put lower price drugs on the formulary? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, we have not seen a wide uptake of the insulins where we lowered the price. Uh, they can always find special forms, uh, formularies where, where they're present, but we have reduced access to those insulins compared to other insulins. So, uh, like you, I'm also a bit skeptical, uh, but I'm willing to explore the opportunity of uh, what we can do together, uh, all of us, to benefit patients uh, living with these I mean, as a, as a general matter, you might think, if the PBM saw the help committee vote a bill out to the floor that was going to put some significant regulation on it by an overwhelming bipartisan margin, they would think, man, man, maybe we better improve a little bit. I see no evidence of improvement. I see ads on TV attacking Congress and telling them not to do PBM reform. So I, I want to get the balance right here. I'm going to continue to vote with this committee to focus on pharmaceutical companies and bring down prices. And if the pharmaceutical companies don't want to negotiate for prescription drug pricing under Medicare, I stand with those who think negotiation is a good idea. But we're letting 
a huge part of this problem that afflicts the everyday American who's trying to afford prescription drugs. We're letting them go scot-free. And we've got a good bill on the floor right now that I think with some improvement could do a great job. And I, ho I hope we'll take it up and I hope we'll devote the same attention and focus to the PBMs as we do to the pharma companies. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Senator Brun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've had so many discussions like this, and I wish I had a big uh, something to hold up, but I want to just talk about this. It has nothing to do with uh, pharma. It happens, it has everything to do with a system that's broken with no transparency, no competition, barriers to entry, and by the way, a consumer who doesn't have the tools to really measure what the best value is. This is a case in California that impacted a sophisticated self-insured plan. And it had a psychiatric uh, underpinning to it. But how that could ever end up being $4 million, that's what the company paid for that case. A self-insured company that's going to be a lot more sophisticated than any individual would be. Cigna, the insurance company, got $2.5 million of what the company paid. Another multi-plan TPA got about 700,000. The provider that actually provided the service, in other words, to affect the cure or the remedy, got 875,000. They are suing the insurance company because they think they didn't get paid enough. And who got screwed was the company and the patient when it was a $4 million claim and the provider that provided all the services charged only eight seventy-five, dollars and they made a profit. So that means the claim was probably 10 times the amount of the underlying cost of the service. That's one side of health care. Hospitals used to be about one-third of the health care dollar. Practitioners, nurses and doctors, maybe independent pharmacists, throw them in there at about one-third. And then pharma and insurance splitting the other third. So the whole thing has gotten convoluted. And then we're talking today about your industry. And I come from the world of distribution. And in any other industry, there's full transparency competition. The consumer drives the dynamic. That's why you don't get by with all the stuff we're talking about. Your business is largely one of heavy fixed costs. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, uh, and research. Uh, yes, which that'd be part of it, research, anything. What are your variable costs generally on a drug like this? So, so the raw As a percentage of your, whatever you're selling it for. That's perhaps uh, 20%. So it's very low. Are you making a profit on your Ozempic product when you're selling it to Australia for $87 and you're selling it to the U.S. for $936? Are you making a profit at $87? Um, yes, we are. And uh, the price you mentioned in the U.S. is not what we get. That's the list price. So what are you getting in the U.S.? What price? So um, I mentioned that on average for our products, we give 74% uh, in rebates to, uh, to PBMs. And, and that was a chart that Senator Marshall yes. held up, that PBMs are making 74% and you're getting 26. Yeah. So and you've got a screwed up industry. Number one, when I've talked to other pharma folks, they regret that PBMs ever came into it. It would seem like, since you make the product, that you could disassemble them or do something that would go around it if, in fact, this place won't do something about it. Have you ever thought of that? It's very difficult, Senator, because they control what insurance is put in front of patients. Um, so they have integrated themselves with the insurance companies uh, and uh, we negotiate against the PBMs, but they are owned by the insurance companies, so no matter what we do, they decide what products patients Okay, and I think we, that's kind of the conundrum, but you're making a profit at $87, and of the 936, it would be the list price. Is that total being split between you and the PBM? 
I know you give big discounts to the PBM. Why do you give them such large discounts for them to make that much money? Um, unless we uh, have a high list price and give them rebates, we are not making it onto the insurance uh, formulary. Uh, so they make a fee based on the list price. So you mentioned distribution. They don't get a flat fee for the, for the distribution. They so after you give the discounts and you do everything, what is your revenue on Ozempic, roughly? So I don't have that number from the top of my head. So on average, That'd be something I think it ought to be on the top of your head because most of us would want to see that so you can make the case against PBMs. And that basic lack of transparency that to me comes from the top that cloaks the system in general is what is impacting the future of why in our own country it's 18% of our GDP and from Canada to Europe it's 10 to 12% of our GDP. Eastern Europe is 6 to 7%. And yes, rationing is maybe going to be one of the results, but it should never be to where something's going to cost that much more here versus there when you're making a profit on it. And until you figure that out, uh, everyone's going to think your industry's screwed up. So um, I'm not sure if it, it was a question, but uh, I just <laughs> want to say that since we launched uh, a product like Ozempic in 18, the price we get has gone down by 40%. So, so uh, there's a and that's good, and it looks like Lilly has got something similar, yes. and they sense competition, and theirs has gone down by 40 to 50 percent, and that's what we need more of. And until you put it out there, expose the PBMs in terms of what they're getting, and you get consumers engaged in it, you're not going to solve the problem. You're going to end up having government as your business partner, because when you operate like an unregulated utility, you're going to get government regulating you. And I think there's a strong interest in that happening. And unless you, hospitals, insurance, take the bull by the horns, you're going to increasingly be in more conversations like this. And I want to end on this. So why should the Europeans and everyone else be um, taking advantage of the fact that we do the R&D, why don't you charge them more to where there's at least not a 10 to 1 differential, to where you share the costs across the world, not put it on the burden of a place that's now borrowing 30 cents on every dollar for whatever's provided through government, and to where you're, you're jabbing it through the private insurance side. Now, why is there that kind of difference? Uh, why don't you charge them more in Europe? So, Senator, we might also uh, do that in the future, but actually the price differential you mentioned is not the real price differential. I think that's part of the problem, that uh, we are not uh, in, uh, charging as much in the U.S. as you... I as think you you're do. hiding behind your opaqueness, and you need to promote transparency for your own good. It'd be easier to understand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brun, and thank you, Mr. Jorgensen. Let me just make a few remarks. I, Senator Braun and I come from different perspectives, but occasionally we agree that the system is broken. Uh, Senator Braun said the industry is screwed up. Is that the correct quote? I don't agree that it's screwed up. It's enormously profitable. It's a company that makes huge profits. Top 10 pharmaceutical companies made over $100 billion in profit last year. It's not screwed up. They are making huge amounts of money. Uh, and I think, Mr. Jorgensen, you are not quite correct when you talk about 79% rebates on Ozempic and Mugovi. That may be in general. My understanding, it's a 40% rebate. That's, I believe that I have heard that, that in fact, the product uh, that after all of the rebates uh, from the PBMs, it's, your product is about, for Ozempic, about $600. Can I clarify that? Please. So our... Price has gone down by 40% since launch, and already when we launched it, there was a significant rebate. So the rebate has gone up by 40% since launch on top of a launch rebate. All right. My understanding 
is that factoring in, and we all agree it is a complicated and broken system. I would point out, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Jorgensen, that in your beautiful country, Denmark, anybody can walk into a doctor's office, go to the hospital. How much do they pay out of pocket? In Denmark, we have, say, a healthcare system that is tax paid. Yes. And how much does an individual pay out of pocket? If I'm in the hospital in two weeks in Denmark, how much do I pay out of pocket? To go to the hospital? Yeah. Uh, zero. Zero. If you go to any doctor, zero. And you are spending a little bit more than half as much per capita as we are. So they provide quality care for all of your people and almost half of what we do. All right. That's a simple system that, to my mind, makes sense. We have a complicated system, not only in healthcare, but in prescription drugs as well. But the point that I want to make is that factoring in all of the rebates, we heard a lot about rebates, I agree with much of the criticism, factoring in all of the rebates that PBMs receive, the net price of Ozempic is still nearly $600, over nine times as much as it costs in Germany. And the estimated net price of Agovi is over $800, nearly four and a half times as much as it costs in Denmark. And I know Senator Romney, others said, well, how is that so? Why is it so much less expensive in Europe? And the answer is obvious. In the United States of America, we are the only major country on earth that does not, has not negotiated prices. So you can charge us any price that you want. Other drug companies can charge us any price that they want, as much as the market will bear, and that's what you do. Understandably, you charge us far more than other countries because they negotiate and regulate prices. Now, the good news, and I share the concerns and the skepticism about PBMs, but we have, as I've mentioned to you and will share with you, statements from the three major PBMs that they would not penalize Novo Nordis in terms of formula placement if you substantially lowered list prices. And I look forward to sitting down with you, your representatives, and the three PBMs to make sure that that happens. Uh, Senator Cassidy, your closing remarks? Yes. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, again, thank you for coming here. I'm sure it's like getting your eye teeth pulled. Um, we spoke, though, ab about those patients who have high deductible plans or health savings accounts. And often they have them because that is what is affordable and works best for them. And it's been my concern that it seems as if the system has been set up to drain those in order to subsidize other actors within the system. Knowing that your current negotiations with PBMs offer no relief for them, I would say that if we are truly concerned about people who are trying to purchase insurance, trying to do the best thing for their family, and then they have a system which manipulates that process to drain their savings in order to pay for a drug as great as your drug is. That's wrong. If you look demographically, um, the, pe the people who have the greatest incidence of um, high BMI of obesity are going to be folks who um, are probably the lowest two to three quintiles of the American population those who might be more likely to have that high deductible policy because that is what's more affordable to them. So there's this kind of this train wreck of those who are trying to do the right thing by their family, by their own health, are the ones who have no allowance made for them in these negotiations between pharma and between PBMs. That is separate from needing the profits, which I thoroughly agree, to drive innovation because I'm all about that innovation, but I'm all about that family. So as you all go forward on that, that would be something I think would relieve tension between policymakers and, and companies such as yours and the PBMs if more consideration were given to them. With that, I close. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, that is the end of our hearing today. I want to thank Mr. Jorgensen for his participation. For any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, Tuesday, October 8th at 5 p.m. I ask unanimous consent to enter the record. Ten statements from patients, doctors, and others concerned about the high cost of Ozempic and Wagovi. The committee stands adjourned.